Hello, everyone, and welcome to the With Chinese Characteristics podcast. I'm Natalie. I'm Cherry. Together, we talk about topics with Chinese characteristics. And boy, Cherry, if I got a topic for us. We're yeah. talking Yellow River. Wow. Part two. Wow. So I'll do I a... like the last episode. Oh, well, thank you, I'm Cherry. I'm very happy we're getting more. <laughs> more Yellow River? Yeah. Can't get enough. This episode, I wonder, really want to get into the height of the Yellow River, of its not like in elevation but in yeah you know in management when the this is a rare opportunity i think to see the chinese imperial system when it really has its <laughs> act together right something about when you when you're like yeah they're doing a good job and that's a rare occasion well it's like when western accounts yeah encounter the qing dynasty yes or even in chinese narratives yeah they're in not today's modern chinese narrative it's not at were, its best yeah. And we often, you know, you hear about the efficiency of the Chinese state and the bureaucracy and all these things, but you don't always get a lot of chances to get examples of that and what no. it looked like yeah. and why it really was effective. So I think if you like, you like ye olde bureaucracy, if you like bureaucracies of the pre-modern times, you're going to like this. Yellow River, recap, yeah. birthplace of Chinese civilization, but also Chinese sorrow. In the last episode, we're all the descendants of the Yellow River, we're all the descend- dragon, yeah, the Yellow Dragon. Yep. Uh, in the last episode, we talked about how the mythology of China's founding is intertwined with the concept of engineering and flood control. Um, yeah. How the how China's example of the Great Flood wasn't something that God stopped. It's that you know we did a bunch the of the imperial system stopped. Yeah, we did a bunch of civil engineering projects. Well, the Song of God <laughs> stopped. The emperor who I know. Who had the mandate of the heavens stopped. But in the end, it was something that got solved with shovels and dirt and... Yeah. You know? And also why the Yellow River is so difficult to manage. We talked about the efforts to control the river, how increased set- settlements in the erodible highlands above the Yellow River Plain, the lowest plateau, created increased sediment in the river, which made the whole situation worse over time. Right? The river gets clogged up. When it gets clogged up, when the water comes... It, the water floods, right? And when it does so flood, it leaves silt everywhere and clogs everything else up too. So it's not that tomorrow's problem will be tomorrow's to solve. It's sort of an accumulation process. Yes. And the more you delay it, yeah. the worse it will get. It's like, it's like, um, yeah, it's like interest payments, you know? It's like you, <laughs> the, the bill yeah. keeps coming due. Yeah. Well, with that analogy, when we left off, the Song Dynasty essentially had declared bankruptcy. Yeah. They're like, you know what? We're just not going to deal with this anymore. Um, they they stopped managing it actively. Then they got forced down to southern China by what would become the Jin Dynasty. Yeah. The Jin Dynasty couldn't really control it either. The kind of philosophy at that time was this flooding is inevitable, so it should just be split up as much as possible. That sort of old idea we talked about in the first episode of like um, like decrease the power by diverting the streams, mm. you know? So they just open up new channels yes. for the water to go to so, along the line. So the trade-off is that you turned huge areas of central China into like a giant marsh. Yeah. Because you just have all these crisscrossing rivers and it floods and it floods everywhere. Right. But, you know, it's cheap. That means that you can't have large-scale populations No. in these areas. It's marshy. You know, you have different groups of people. You have bandits there and stuff, but... Oh, so I just want to add... Mm-hmm. You know, we're China is big today. Yeah. The official territory. But like back in those days, China was like a very small part of what is China today. So if you're losing the entire area that's along the Yellow River, yeah, that's a big cost to stomach. Yeah, no, I know. And it's, it's no small, it's, you know, it's not just a couple of towns. No, no, no. It's, it's a big deal. Um, and the only reason that really becomes possible as an option, well, A... Well, the Jin Dynasty doesn't, you know, have a choice because they're kind of in a chaotic situation. But the only reason that really becomes an option is because the south of China becomes so valuable. Yeah. Um, you have new big cities or newer large cities like Nanjing and Shanghai and Canton that are um, becoming more and more important. You have more and more rice production and things down there. Yeah. Um, so they decided to sacrifice. Yeah. So they basically the decided region. to sacrifice that they only build flood defenses around major cities and other important locations okay also they would constantly flood the area for war the song dynasty would do it the yuan dynasty would do it when they were trying to take over the jin dynasty would do it if you think you know there's an army and you can break a dam and flood them out you're just gonna do it and it doesn't you don't really care 
Yeah. The can we back step uh, mm-hmm. s- uh, to where you said you basically only focus on protecting the si- the major cities. Yeah. Um, and that's basically I I feel like that's still the same. A couple of years ago, when there was that huge flood during the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, in China. And there was obviously we have social media now. And back in the days we did not you know, mm-hmm. peasant didn't really have a voice. But you would hear people in smaller towns talk about their experiences online during the flood. Mm-hmm. And they were basically like, yeah, we just get flooded. And they will they will control the flood, meaning that they will open the what do you call it? Open the floodgates, the floodgates to the to the countryside mm. in order to divert um, to, you know, release the pressure yeah. um, of the water going to the bigger cities. So every province has a capital, and if you're one of the people who live in the capital city, you are lucky in that regard. That they'll sacrifice other areas. They will sacrifice the surrounding areas. But the the problem with the surrounding areas is that people's livelihoods are are their land. Yeah. Are their fish pounds, are their, you know, little uh, yard that they have outside their door that all gets flooded. Um, So they sort of, they essentially get sacrificed. Um. Well, for the major cities keep that in mind that's as, still true today so. as we talk about as we talk about what's going to happen in this episode yeah okay so now we're in the ren dynasty mm. the ren dynasty first they conquer the jin dynasty which only controls northern china and then they eventually conquer the um southern song dynasty as yeah. well we're familiar with that we're, we're this uh cherry's familiar with that because that's basically the setting of uh um, water margin well no more like uh condor heroes Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was very obsessed when I was like, little. Like, like Wuxia, yes. Wuxia stories. So the Yuan Dynasty has a lot on its plate, right? They've got a bunch of civil wars. There's succession crises. Mm-hmm. They keep trying to invade Japan. Yeah. But being a wide continent-spanning empire, they also have some options that previous Chinese dynasties had not. Mm. For example, they're like, where does this Yellow River come from? <laughs> previous Chinese dynasties, <laughs> maybe they had had an idea, yeah. but they couldn't really go out there. No, it's, it's a not bunch their of groups, territory. Yet. No, it's a bunch of groups of people who all hate them. Yeah. Um, but you know, so they send some, you know, um, people out to go find the source of the Yellow River. They start to map it, um, and then they start to um, expand, repair, and connect what was known as the Grand Canal. Mm. Now, Grand Canal is kind of like the Great Wall. It's not like it's just one thing. Mm, it's yes. multiple things built at multiple times. Yeah. Um, sometimes their pieces are connected. Sometimes they're not. But it's sometimes just kind of, it's course shifts as well. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes the course shifts as well. <laughs> yeah. But it, you know, it's just sort of referred to as the Grand Canal. Mm. Um, as an empire focused more on the north of China, the Grand Canal would be instrumental in sending food and other tribute north to their centers of power. This cool. is a gi- giant man-made, you know, river essentially that you can move boats on from north to south China. Yes, a transportation network vessel. Yeah, like a blood blood vessel. Yeah. Vessel vessel. <laughs> what I was gonna say is we're gonna have a few episodes talking about the Grand Canal, the history of the Grand Canal mm. in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. Yeah, yeah. We're in a we're in a water. We're in a, a, a water heavy season. Yeah, water heavy uh, yeah. season here. Not that we have seasons anymore. We've abandoned that uh, structure at the podcast. No. Anyways, please continue. <laughs> the, the Grand Canal, building yeah. it, um, that then necessitated careful Yellow River management. As we discussed in the first episode, the Yellow River, when it floods, it's full of silt, with, you know, dirt essentially. Mm. And if that gets into the Grand Canal or the things connecting to the Grand Canal, it will clog the Grand Canal with dirt. And then it's basically unusable. You have to take all this time and effort to clear it out. You might have to drain it. It's incredibly a lot of work. So in order to protect the Grand Canal, which was an engineering project. Yes. Which they really wanted to, you know, what's the point if you build a canal and it just gets filled up with mud? Well, that's what happened. They, they They rebuilt the Grand Canal. Right. They didn't have a good way of controlling the Yellow River. It continued to wander and change course. Mm -hmm. It continued to break the Grand Canal. Okay. And Yuan Dynasty, last few decades of its existence, it was plagued by multiple disasters near its end, floods, plagues, drought, earthquakes. Hmm. The floods in particular damaged or destroyed many canals, hampering the dynasty's ability to control the country. Losing the mandate of the heavens. I feel like Ren's song to Ming Dynasty, that's almost like the archetypical mandate of heaven situation, (laughs) right? You have like... All these natural disasters, all these things. Yeah. And then you have this guy who comes out of nowhere. Yeah. Right from very poor background. Yeah. And becomes 
becomes the emperor, essentially. Right. We're talking about the first emperor of the Ming dynasty. Yes. He leads like a, yeah. a, a, a bandit rebel army and, yeah. and forms a dynasty. Yeah. You know, the Ren dynasty, they try other stuff. They try and ship grain by ocean instead. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're not a maritime people. There's large-scale piracy. Oh, really? We're not? <laughs> <laughs> the Mongols? Well, okay, I guess even more so the Mongols. I'm, I mean, I think Chinese maritime people. Are just, we? Just not very far out. <laughs> Just only in the Southeast China Sea. Yeah. <laughs> Which is China's property. Yeah. I'm joking. Sorry, Philippines. <laughs> I think I think our audience will understand. Yeah. Well, maybe. Yeah, we're joking. Yeah. It's not, we're not condoning. It's not good. We're not condoning the <laughs> nine dash line. What they're line. doing. Yeah. At the end of the Ren Dynasty, in 1351, the, they have this engineer named Jia Lu, who was tasked with creating a single channel for the Yellow River. Mm. So instead of being split among all these channels... They're like, no, we need to force it back into a single manageable direction. Okay. And this general course that the Ren Dynasty put it on is going to stay until the 1850s. So about 500 years. Oh, so they, they succeeded. Small well, alert. That doesn't no? mean mm -hmm. that the strategy has changed. Okay. Instead of a bunch of courses, instead of a bunch of courses that um, would spread out in every direction, they had one main one, but they still had all of these other things you know, to divert the water. So they still had lots of diversion canals and okay. drainage ponds and other things. And they sort of... Just not actual river routes. Yeah. And they sort of still expected it to flood periodically. Sure. But this all came to an end. Mandate of Heaven Lost. 1368, rebels capture Beijing and declared the Ming Dynasty. Mm. Beijing, however, was far to the north, past the Yellow River, and surrounded by essentially marshy wasteland yeah. at the time. Yes. So the capital. A lot of people still argue today. But the, so the capital was moved to Nanjing. Yeah. The Ming continued the Yuan Dynasty's methods by and large, accepting wide-scale, low-intensity periodic flooding along the river's length instead of attempting to tightly contain it. This made commerce and travel from north to south difficult. It clogged up canals and it limited population in the floodplain. Mm. However, in 1402, the Yongle Emperor took the throne. He's a very interesting guy, the Yongle okay. Emperor but we don't have time to get into him too much. But one thing he did do was move his base of power from, from Nanjing to Beijing mm. and repair the Grand Canal. However, once again, and this is partially related to the fact that he's also building the Great Wall, which is creating a lot of erosion activity. Right. <laughs> um, the Grand Canal keeps flooding again. Okay. So once again, they rebuild the Grand Canal. Once again, it, it keeps breaking. Yeah. So there was some consideration as the decades went on of, Maybe we just abandon the Yellow River management again. We just, we just, <laughs> just let it go. Just let it go. Just let it do what it wants. They're like, we've tried lots of options. We've tried, we've tried building levees. We've tried dredging, more drainage channels, you know, different routes. Yeah. You know, ponds. But, you know, the problem wasn't going away. Right. So in 1577, though, there's this guy involved with grain transport from the south to the north. And his name was Wu Guifong, mm -hmm. who proposed the issue was that wasn't that there's too much water is that there's not enough water by spreading the river out you made the problem worse because the water moved slow and deposited dirt everywhere mm. the answer was to have a single narrow channel that would flow quickly out to sea and dump most of the dirt out there mm. so that you didn't have it constantly clogging right. everything up okay in 15 so the water to moderate ratio yes Right. Needs to be higher. Yes. And the velocity needs to be higher. Right? right. It needs to be moving faster. Yeah. So therefore the narrow, narrower channel. Yes. Yeah. So in 1578, this guy named Ji Hoon, superintendent of the Grand Canal, okay. he was tasked with putting this into practice. Beyond the defensive works, flood works meant to quickly push the water out to sea, which we're going to get into the details of. Trust me. <laughs> water would be stored in lakes, mainly Lake Hongzhi, and used to flush the river clean in times of low flow. Mm. So they're like, when the river's high, we'll store it in lakes. When it's, when it's low and muddy, we'll release water okay. so that it'll keep it flowing right. and, and, and keep, it, keep it clear. That all sounds like it makes sense. Right. Is it going to end well? Well, so this, this philosophy of concentrating the river in a single quick flowing channel was known as restrict the current to attack the silk or shu shui gongsha. It's important to note, while keeping the river contained is important for transport, commerce, and population density as a whole, it actually made farming worse around the river. 
as the peri- previous periodic low intensity flooding was better for restoring the soil. Ah. Oh. You know, it would flood a little bit. You, you know, you could um, the when it was flowing weekly, all the dirt would settle down. Right. And then the top part of the water was still like a little muddy, but it was like the good mud. Okay. And you could use that for your fields. And, all right. But no, that's we don't care about the farmers. Right. We got to get the Grand Canal working. Yeah. Overall, though, a well-controlled Yellow River and a well-maintained Grand Canal allowed large amounts of goods to flow across China, all tracked and taxed and adding to the state's coffers. This came at a cost, though, a literal one, as this new method of management required huge monetary amounts, both for the hydraulic works themselves and for managing, repairing, and administering them. Mm. It created a new series of positions in the River Conservancy, who were responsible not only for engineering systems, but also administrative and military forces such as river soldiers. Jobs program. It's a very much a jobs program. The river soldiers are kind of, they are soldiers, mm-hmm. but they're also like construction workers. And they're there because if there's an emergency, you know, you're the official in charge of an area of the river, you might need to re- do an emergency repair, or build something, and you can't, right. you don't have time to go out and like find peasants and convince them to do it. You need mm-hmm. to have people there. So it's a whole big system. Yeah. So this that's, is, you know, that's sort of like a military, like industry. It's like the Army Corps of Engineers. You yeah, know, yeah, US yeah, Army exactly. Corps yeah. of Engineers. Yeah. So this is from Controlling the Dragon, Confucian Engineers <laughs> and the Yellow River in Late Imperial China by Randall Dodgen. Gotta tame the dragon. Can tame the dragon. I was, just, I was talking about Game of Thrones, the first episode, but um, yeah. it's the, weird. The result was the emergence of a new category of specialist bureaucrat, okay. the Confucian Engineer. Their predecessors and contempor- like their predecessors and contemporaries, these men were literati administrators, product of the examination system and schooled in Neo-Confucian ethics. Oh, okay. What set them apart was not their preparation, but their aptitude. Although most showed competence in general administration, they rose to high positions in the River Conservancy because of their skill in hydraulic engineering. Okay. So they're the products of the imperial exam system, yes. which does not test no. <laughs> on engineering skills no. or math or no. anything like that. Um, it's all just sort of like basically we'll, we'll talk about it, but they people and re- people get regular lower positions there. And there are some lower positions in the River Conservancy as well. And for the higher positions, you just see who did a good job. Mm, OK. And it's, it's so like a merit based system. Yes. But it yeah. is technical, right? There's and. You know, it's not like you go to a college for it. Yeah. But there's lots of books written about it that you're kind of expected to read. There's, right. you know, letter writing groups where people talk about the solutions for things. What's you a know. letter writing group? Well, there's like, they're like, um, you know, there's all these scholars. They'd have little, they'd write letters to each other and, oh, okay. you know, put comments on them and they get passed around. Oh, okay. All right. You know. Like a review club. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what happened in the Opium Wars too. When everyone's like, what do we do about the opium? And everyone's putting their two cents in and... Oh, okay. The well, the, yeah, they, they write it to the emperor, though. They always I know, but sometimes like they a... write them to each other, too. Oh, okay. They have these All little right. groups. Okay, so we have communication. We have the circle of scholars. Yes. Confusion scholars. Mm-hmm. So and... they differ from earlier hydraulic engineering notables in that few enjoyed great influence or prestige outside of their specialist specialized arena. Oh. So a lot of the earlier people who had these big ideas for hydraulic engineering, they were like somebody... Already, already important. Already important. They had the emperor's ear. Right. You know, they had some other politics. They got it done. These are people who, they don't really engage in politics, politics in China yeah. as a whole. They're just focused on... It's just sure. an engineering job. Just just an engineering job. I mean, I like that. That's good. I think I think that's good. I think, well, they, you know, they had a pretty good track record. The appointments of these experts to high positions for extended tours of duty shows that even emperors dubious of specialist skills recognized that officials with little experience in river works and no aptitude for engineering could not manage the Yellow River Grand Canal hydraulic system. So the, oh, wow. So it's just, you know, I feel like... They're the, more advanced than us today. Than yes. The Chinese government, uh, today's uh, uh, standards of... It. <laughs> there, is a, um, there is a know-it-all aspect to the Chinese imperial system of administrators. Yeah. Of that, like... Anything should be able to be figured out in about 10 minutes by a applying confusion, applying confusion thought and like yeah. wisdom and like reasoning yeah. it out. And yeah. so you don't need anybody specialist. No, but they seem to understand that like at this point in history, 
that you need actual water engineers to, to engineer the yes. water. Yes, and you need to yeah. know how all these things work and how to fix yeah. it and, and the properties of water and how it works. You know, the confusion thoughts are, not the confusion thoughts, the confusion, I don't know, theories are kind of like, I guess, Xi Jinping thoughts, you know. In order to be a good Chinese government official, you don't really need expertise. No. You just, you just need to be very good at... Uh, Party, <laughs> party <laughs> principles. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, I think you do get some, you know, well, we can, we, we can do a whole episode on the efficacy of the Chinese mm. imperial exam system on whether or not it actually produced yeah. people who are good at their jobs. Yeah. But the, the search for bureaucrats with technical leanings and proven hand on, hands-on abilities to operate the system led to the lower ranks of the river and canal bureaucracy. Officials who excelled as river circuit attendants or as magistrates in counties along the river, where their duties included river engineering, were most often those recruited to fill the higher posts. The results of that practice were mixed. Promoting officials from within provided proven competence, but it could also lead to charges of cronyism. Opponents of the Grand Canal transport op system often pointed to patronage as a source of corruption and a reason why the system needed to be abandoned. Who so are the opponents of the... Grand Canal water management system. Well, they just think we should just let the river do whatever. Ah, okay. Or we're just people who are like, or like oppositions in court. Yeah. People, or there's people who we'll get into who are like, you know, the river doesn't actually flood that much. You know, mm -hmm. it hasn't flooded in like 500. You know, it hasn't like, you know, they, they I don't think 500 years. Maybe well, I mean, five it, years. it floods. It floods periodically. Right. But like, you know, they're like, it, it's not that bad. They're asking for all this money all the time. We don't really understand if they need it or not because they're the only ones who claim. Right, they to understand need how it works. But isn't the water not flooding because they have spent well, exactly, the money? Exactly. Okay. So, and and it, but it does go against the standard Chinese imperial advancement yes. system. Yeah. You know, you have different posts; they're way apart from each other. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to have any connections to anything. But in the water management system, it's a it's a small network. Mm. You know, you 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 make a lot of connections within it. You get promoted through it, through yeah. personal relations sometimes. Anyway, now instead of river management being a thing added piecemeal, quotes over, by the way, but now river management, instead of a thing added piecemeal to the jobs of already overworked magistrates in mm -hmm. Riverside counties, it had its own department, essentially, mm. who could look at it holistically. This river conservancy was somewhat separate from the mainline forms of advancement within the imperial bureaucracy, and it has its pros and cons. So number one, as stated, it's a technical position with a high level of knowledge required. Lower levels in the conservancy had to take great time and effort to acquire the knowledge of hydraulic management practices, which weren't always standardized or easy to get, and ensure they were properly carried out. Right. So there's no guidebook, right? There's no procedures. You just kind of have to look at what previous people did. People write text on it, mm -hmm. and then you have to do what seems correct. Right. right? There's not like a certificate you can get or anything. No. Uh, there were huge opportunities for graft. As a Confucian engineer, you are responsible for spending vast arrays of money, mostly on labor and materials for maintenance and repairs. Small amounts of corruption can lead to... Also, no one else really understands what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> they can't necessarily verify like right. what you've spent the money on. Small amounts of corruption can lead to vast fortunes over time. You also have access to hundreds of thousands of river troops, depending on your position. Mm -hmm. Number three, downside. Failures are harshly penalized. A single large-scale failure of defensive works under your control will often lead to dismissal or worse. And there is a complex series of fines by which you and your subordinates are forced to pay back the state for repairs. This you have to pay you as have a to government pay. official? You have to pay. Oh, my God. This often leads to more corruption as river officials need to save up money for a rainy day. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> yeah. Literally. I would, too, so if they, it were me. So yeah. they, they, they steal the stuff, they save up the money, and then it's like... If there is an emergency, they got some cash to cover it. If it's all good, then hey, they got a retirement bonus. So, <laughs> so more so than many, many positions, your career can be destroyed by things outside your control. Whether lack of funding, poor or insufficient materials, or political infighting can make it difficult or impossible to do your job and prevent flooding. And every year, as we discussed in the previous episode, the whole system becomes more clogged with silt and unmanageable. Yeah. It's a different track, The interest right? is adding on. Interest is adding up. So, but let's talk now about what does it mean to manage the river in this time period. So like late 1500s, late Ming Dynasty to the Qing Dynasty. So let's talk about what it actually means, you know, to restrict the flow to attack the silt. Shu shui gong shua. 
For most of the river, you would have two sets of dikes and levees. One narrow one, called luti, or thread dikes, which was meant to contain the river during non-flood times. Okay. These are what most think of when we think of levees. And they would keep the river in a rare t- relatively narrow channel as they followed it on its course for most of the year. So, you know, you go see a river. It's got maybe modern day, they're concrete river banks, mm-hmm. you know, that keep the river where it's supposed to go. And yeah. it, they curve around the river, right? Um, then there was a larger set some distance away from the thread dikes called distant dikes or yalti, which formed the edges of a giant area for the flood to fill in disasters. Mm. These would be hundreds or even thousands of meters away and form a huge area for the water to fill. So that area is where you don't want to settle or, or plant. No, nobody, uh, can. nobody can. Okay. Nobody can live there. Um, in some areas, only the outer dikes were built. So further up north, closer to the source of the river, the flow is faster. They only built the outer ones. Um, I think there's also not, you know, they're not as worried up there about it doing stuff they don't intend. In any case, the goal was to keep the river fast moving in the dry times with the narrow dikes and contain it when it was surging with flood water with the wider dikes. Hmm. The idea also was that as the river flooded, it would deposit sediment between the narrow dikes and the faraway dikes and um, kind of doing the engineers work for them as it sort of filled up that area um, and kind of reinforced it. Okay. Added more dirt to it. As you can imagine, this area between the dikes could be quite extensive, and it was rendered unsuitable for permanent settlement. So sometimes later on in the management, you would be making hydraulic decisions about where to put the dikes or where to move stuff, and it would be influenced by nobles in the area because if you know you, uh, you move you move the dike a little bit, you know you reclaim a bunch more land. Yeah, yeah. You can put peasants there. You know you can do whatever. So um, it would become pi- quite political. Now overall, this was a good system for their needs. But there was a number of ways it could go wrong. So one way, of course, is that the distant dikes were built too close or too weak, or just in general, there wasn't enough space for the water between them. Okay. This could result in the water overtopping the dikes. Then it goes everywhere. Then it goes everywhere. There was a disaster that happened, or a nearly averted disaster that happened a couple years ago in California, in the Orville Dam, where the dam overtopped. And the water just started coming down the side. This was a couple years ago. And it very quickly started to erode you know, the other side of the, of the wall. Yeah. Right. Cause it's just dirt. And yeah. if that goes on enough, it collapses it. And then, you know, the whole, the whole dam collapses. Right. So if the dam gets overtopped or if the dike gets overtopped, um, all hell breaks loose. All hell breaks loose eventually. Now I'm using dike and levee kind of interchangeably. So sure. I, I have seen different descriptions of the difference between the two. Okay. But different things I've read have said different things. So if you're a hydraulic engineer and I'm using these words wrong, <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, I'm just... Uh, but for our other audiences, just know that we're using it interchangeably. Yeah, it's like a bunch of dirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alongside building these, these protections higher uh, as necessary, there's other efforts to try and stop this. Like, for example, you know, you require trees and bushes to be planted on top of them. So that way, if water does come or rain, it's less likely to wash it away. Right. But um, overall, the only real protection against this is you either build it higher or you, um, you know, build them further away. Another common way is meanders. What's now, meanders? Well, this is all very complicated. I'm not a hydraulic engineer or even a confusion engineer, but I'll do my best to explain. Okay. So rivers, Cherry, as you may have noticed, tend not to go straight. Oh, really? No. They tend to wiggle. Yeah. <laughs> you know? They've got... The wiggly they got rivers. curves, right? Yes. You, you know, you see a river, it's got wiggles. Yeah. There's multiple reasons this can happen, but one of them is inherent to the way river flows operate. If the path of a river is curved, they w- the water will flow faster on the outside of the curve than on the inside. Yes. That means the curve will get bigger because uh, it flows faster on the outside. So it scoops dirt away from the outside. Faster, yeah. And it flows slower on the inside. So it deposits dirt. Okay. So over time, it will wiggle out further and further and further. <laughs> It'll just keep wiggling. Okay. Um, this tends to self-correct after a while because if the loop gets too big, the river sort of seems to snip them off eventually um, and return to a straighter course. Okay. And you can see this on some rivers. You can see little lakes alongside the river where there was a meander mm-hmm. and it eventually kind of got closed off because gotcha. it sort of meandered too far. Right. And there was a more efficient path for the water to go through. Okay. That makes sense. I'd never thought of 
about that, but... So the distance a meander can develop before it collapses on a river is called the meander belt. So it's okay. normally like 18 to 20 times the, the width of the river so that the, the water can kind of go out and come back. It's okay. kind of typical, right? The Yellow River being a high sediment and high flow river tended in this period to have a quite dramatic meander belt, which could change very quickly. Okay. This means that even if there wasn't enough water to overtop or collapse a dike, the meander could develop quickly, snake through an area sideways, hit a dike, eat through the bottom of it, which would then cause it to collapse, and it would spill out in the countryside. Okay. So the river would suddenly, you know, scoot out to the left, bigger and bigger curve. Yeah. Hit hit the hit the side of a um hit the side of a dike and just sort of like eat through it. Yeah. And then the thing collapses, and then because again, remember the river tends to be higher. Yeah. Than the ground around it. Once it gets through the dike, it's it's, still, it's, yeah. it's out to the races. It's gone. So. So stopping and these preventing these meanders seems to be a primary task of the River Conservancy. So how do you do it? How do you do it? Well, there are preventative measures. You can build deflection dikes, which are supplemental structures built outward into the river control area to try and force the river current away from important areas or discourage meanders. You can think of them like adjusting the vents on an air conditioner, but permanent, I guess. You basically build a wall out into the water. Right. And you normally build it like stone so it won't like erode. Okay. And it just kind of like pushes the water in a different direction. Okay. So if it seems to be one a meander and like, you know, hit an important levee or somewhere where the flood control defenses are weak, you know, you just kind of push it the other direction. And it'll tend to go the other way. So more walls. More walls. Okay. It's your people's solution to everything. <laughs> so these are expensive because, again, they're made of stone. Yeah. Um, and they have to be used sparingly. And I'm assuming that it's uh, more expensive and more work to, or lab- labor heavy to construct projects with stones than just dirt. Yes, especially because people have lived here for thousands of years. Most of the stone is picked over. There's just not that many good places. <laughs> no, there's not. There's not that many good places to get stone. So you have to transport it from far okay. away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm laughing. I don't know why, but it's, it's true. And also the scale. Yeah. You know, you talk about like a castle, you know, in, in like in like Europe and you're like, oh, it's made of stone. And it's like it's like a big house. Right. And it's like you're talking about some of these flood control works are yeah. cl- are kilometers long. Right. Right. It's just the, like the, so the amount of materials yeah, that you it, need it requires is, is, is way is more a huge than amount you can of material. Yeah. yeah. And it all has to be chipped out of a mountain somewhere. Right. And carried on baskets. You know, yeah, they didn't have trucks back then. No. Yeah. And that's, that's another thing of a lot of times in, in Europe where you would build a castle, mm-hmm. you would build it somewhere where you knew you had access to stone. <laughs> so you wouldn't right. like necessarily just build it where you wanted. You go, oh, there's a stone mine, you know, half a mile there. So th- that, you know, this is where we'll build it. Well, but you can't do that with the Yellow River. No. <laughs> the Yellow River doesn't care where there is uh, <laughs> where there's material. It's going to do whatever it wants. However, these meanders could appear quite suddenly during a flood and could snake out to the edge of a levee extremely quickly. Moving several meters per hour, it seems. Several meters per hour. Yes. Do you want to do you want to convert that to? You know, I don't know, five feet an hour. Yeah. You know, Ten okay. feet an hour. Just for our American audience. American <laughs> listeners. And if there was no other flood control structures to stop them, emergency f- measures had to be taken. Okay. So the answer is stalk revetments. Was a what? Stalk revetments okay i will patiently which, wait for you to which are big it, bundles of stalks left okay. over from agricultural production okay bound tightly with rope and secured in place with iron spikes so you could think of them almost like a hay bale H- how does a hay bale stop water well so <laughs> if a meander is getting close to the wall of a dike uh-huh. or they're worried about you know erosion in general uh-huh. huge numbers of stock bundles were applied to the threatened area once they got wet these bundles basically halted erosion as the water couldn't get through them. Oh, okay. You know, they get wet, but the water can't erode through them and get to the dirt. Okay. They keep the dirt behind them in place. Something similar is used here in California and other places after wildfires. Since there aren't any plants to prevent mudslides, they cover the hills in this sort of like burlap hemp cloth. Okay. Which keeps the dirt in place and allows plants to grow through it. Oh. It stops the force of the water, the stalks... Um, you know, they get waterlogged, you know, they get kind of heavy and, you know, they prevent it from going any further. Mm. These stalk revetments were used extensively. However, being biological material in close contact with water, they would only last a few years before rotting away. Mm. Given they had a cost and were in limited supply, there was a constant attempt to get as much use out of them as possible before replacing them. 
However, if they were to disintegrate or rot away at an inopportune time called shedding, it could leave an area of the river defenseless and open it up to a breach. Okay. You know, you think, oh, we got another year out of those things. And then there's flooding, and then you see them all just start washing down the river. Right. And you're like, oh, oh, crap. Assuming the emergency passed and the defense is held, during the dry season, laborers would often close off meanders by dredging straighter paths for the river and returning it to its course. As you can imagine, this was all very stressful. In yeah, a time, I'm stressed. Be, in a time before instantaneous communication or photographs. <laughs> a river official would have dozens of trouble spots in the wet season and would have a balance, a limited supply of stalks, bundles, labor, and other resources between them, hoping to make the right decisions based on limited information. So you can't, uh, you can't fill every hole that's leaking. You can only... And a lot of times it's not even leaking yet. Yeah. You just think, okay, you know, where's, where's the hot spot, right? right? You know, like this, somebody says, oh, the river's, you know, about to breach the levee up north. I said, well, do you send all your soldiers up there? What if there's something down south, right? Right. You, you know, so you don't you really know. You have to know. prioritize them, but you don't necessarily know at the time of... No. You know... Without modern technology. And, no, right? Yeah. You're, it's, it's all at the speed of a horse. <laughs> so many officials, and that's if they can afford a horse, right? I mean, sometimes it's the speed of a guy running. Yeah. So, so many officials and even more of their workers would die early of stress, overwork, and accidents as they traveled up and down the river inspecting the defenses and trouble spots and occasionally even having to get involved themselves. Oh, man. It's the job was a high casualty rate. Yeah. I mean, and there's, you know, some sometimes if it's an emergency... You know, obviously, you think of the Confucian officials as these kind of like stuffy guys in the little study with their scrolls and stuff. But these, but these people, you know, they have to be standing there in the storm, you right. know, telling people what to do because you know, and if it goes wrong, then they die too. So there's a lot I want to talk about involving the politics of all this, um, the pros, the cons, the little court squabbles, and all of that. But yeah, I think that's going to have to wait for a third episode. Okay. But let's talk of a case study. So in 18. 18- so it's 1840. The Daoguang Emperor, who we know and love from our Opium War episodes, <laughs> know and love, yeah, has a lot to worry about, Cherry. Yeah, no, he, he has so many troubles. He's stressed. He's so he was so stressed. He has a war with some angry foreigners, rebellions, piracy, opium, inflation, yeah, and a shortage of silver. Right? Nothing was going right for Daoguang Emperor. Nothing was going right, right? We rec- uh, this is not not a self promotion, but really, um, everyone should watch. The Opium, uh, War the Opium War movie. It's so good. Yeah. We did a, we <laughs> had a review Emperor on it. With this like head in his hands. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm surrounded by idiots. Yeah. Um, so many problems. Yeah. But uh, listen to our, yeah. Watch that movie or reference our prequel to the Opium War episode if you'd know more. So the governor general of the Hunan Conservancy dies of overwork. Hunan as in the, the province? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, if you are interested, Natalie and our listeners... Uh, Henan is the uh, literally the province name of the province means r- south of the river, which is pre- presumably the river would be the Yellow River here. Yes, I think so. Yeah. There's also a north uh, Hebei fr- province, which means the north of the river province. Mm. So, uh, so I like how we name things. I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> What's well, all efficient? What's California? You know, What's, yeah. where where did California come from? No, you know, this is all very efficient. Jerry. Yeah, it's like naming like servers, <laughs> you know, in a data center. <laughs> Yes. So he dies, this guy named Lil Yume, who is something of an innovator as well as an extremely diligent engineer. He had risen up through the ranks and had a reputation for his skill at hydraulic management. Okay, a professional. Professional. So he dies in 1840. Dao Gong, though, beset by all these multiple crises, wanted to cut costs somewhere. He began to oh, view no. the vast expense of river management <laughs> as a sign of wasteful excess and corruption. After all, it seemed to cost more and more money every year, and the river hadn't seriously flooded in decades. What are they spending all that money on, Cherry? <laughs> right? So you he, know, it, <laughs> <laughs> which I mean, I'm sure we're we've laughing all, here. I'm sure we've all been there. I know we're laughing here, but I'm sure this says this is not uncommon in terms of like no. budget planning in, I mean, look in at various the, governments. Look and, at like the COVID stuff of like yeah. they're like there hasn't been a pandemic in like the decades. Yeah, FEMA. And, what? Like yeah. what, what does what, we, what does FEMA need all these money for? There's yeah. no natural disasters. Why do we have all these <laughs> ventilators sitting yeah. around? <laughs> exactly. So he puts an outsider in. Again, not, uh, uh, not involved with the River Conservancy at all. Never really held any position involving hydraulic engineering. Named Wen Chong in as his replacement. So he didn't know anything. But he's like, you know, no, I'm going to go in there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shake things up. Sure. I'm going to cut costs. I'm going to find the corruption. Yeah. All that. I'm an outsider. I'm, you I'm know, an you, outsider. You, you want an outsider. You, you don't Gong, want an establishment. Dao Gong goes great, you know. 
these foreigners, they keep attacking us. They're asking for money. They're mad that I burned their opium. Well, or, money's going to come from somewhere. Yeah. Not from my, my own uh, household budget, though. No. But <laughs> <laughs> not, not from, from my harem. emperor, emperor <laughs> expeditions. Or, I, don't yeah. know. I don't actually know if Dogwan went on many expeditions. I think he was <laughs> probably too stressed to go to expeditions. Uh. Okay. Um, so we he, should talk about, we should do an episode on Qianlong and his expeditions. I always find that funny. I don't know. Qianlong is a Qing, Qing. The guy after Qing Kangxi? The guy after Kangxi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Might be Kangxi's grandson, I think. I think it is, yeah. Well, yeah. that's who, the, that's who McCartney met in 17. Yeah, yeah. But he's yeah. like a, supposedly he's like a fond emperor. He loves all the finer <laughs> well, things well, in life. it was a good time, and, Cherry. Yeah. To him, it was a good time, but many. Kong, his, Kangxi went in and put down all the they all put down all the rebellions and took all the territory and yeah. smashed everybody down and well, then ma- ma- chen long is just living in the good times right <laughs> no so but many would argue that chen long was very much a close like his policies has led to the decline the decline or is the beginning of the decline beginning of the end anyways um well you know i don't know if there's any longer emperor who, who could really who could really make the imperial chinese system work <laughs> with uh modern statecraft so uh but well, you know, maybe they, they although they, it sounds like they did have a model in terms of they did. this water division. They did. Only if they follow through instead of sending some guy who doesn't know anything <laughs> to manage them. Well, so, so let's see how this how does this play out, Natalie? <laughs> so he goes in, he sacks officials, he denies projects, he does all sorts of stuff. <laughs> okay. Now, a certain amount of corruption then and now is required for a lot of systems in China to function. Yes. There is corruption, but there's corruption. Yes. There so is, as an example. Yeah. Maybe you submit a report for some work that doesn't need to be done, but then you save the money and materials for later. So when something does happen, you don't have to like go through a bunch of hoops, right? Okay. Right? Or maybe... So you're like kind of gaming the system, but like in order for the system to work. Yes. In order to do your job, you have to game the system. Yes. Okay. Or maybe you go for one big repair, you know, and then you do a bunch of small ones, or you ask for a bunch of little small maintenance things, and you make a big change. <laughs> no one really knows what they're doing. Because no one else understands this stuff. But breaking down the big contract into smaller contracts yeah. is a m- very much a practice that's well and alive in the American, American corporate business. system. Yeah. So, so uh, or yeah. you, you undertake repairs that haven't been approved, and then later on, you submit a fake project to pay everyone. <laughs> so there's the previous guy who just died, Liu Yumei. Okay. Uh, Wen Chong found out he had done this. He would just make a bunch of stuff at the beginning of the year, get it approved, and then spends it all how he thought was necessary. Okay. You know, whatever he thought needed to be done, he would okay. just do it. So, but it's not the kind of corruption where, I mean, I'm sure some of these officials are became Again, rich, you have right? to, but, you, you know, yeah. there's a little bit expected, right? Yeah. But, but, but it's not like 100% of the money went into their own pockets. No, because in, in the end, the, the river, you can't negotiate with the river. No, right. You right? still have to do a job. Yeah, you yeah. still have to do a job. If you have like a ten percent for yourself, then that's just the yeah. commission fee. Unlike the <laughs> unlike the Qing Dynasty military, yeah. the river you know doesn't wait doesn't wait fifty years. Your failure in between will battles. show. Yes. Yeah. So in any case, Wen Chong puts an end to all that. He's like, no, everything has to be approved. Uh oh. I'm gonna you know scrutinize every contract. Bureaucracy no, wing. No no improvements that I feel are unnecessary. Okay. Right? And obviously, every year there's a bunch of changes that have to be made. Mm. 1841. So this is from. Controlling the dragon, mm. the Confucian engineers. <laughs> the break occurred at the Zhangfu Lower Commandery, one of the sites Liu Yumei, the outgoing guy, had warned about. On the evening of August 2nd, Li's replacement as head of the Hunan, Hunan Conservancy, Wei Chong, began receiving reports that the Yellow River was threatening to overflow the main dike along its south bank, due north of Kaifeng. I really the, like how this, this is phrased, as in the Yellow River, threatening. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's you know, a battle. The Yellow right? River's like blackmailing. You know? <laughs> it's like, it's, I'm, it's, I'm about to do that if you don't start managing me. It's a war. Yeah. yeah. The summer flood stage had been unusually high. Okay. And incessant rains in the tributary rivers of the lowest plateau and in Henan continued to swell the river. Mm. On the second, the river reached the top of the dike near the 31st water, watcher station, Bao, which is, I guess, what they're called. They're called Baos, and began to pour over from Zhongzhuan. As the area near the 31st station was known locally, the waters flew, flowed directly south, covering the 7.5 kilometers to Kaifeng during the night. Morning found alarmed residents trying to keep out the rising waters by hastily barring the gates of the city. Okay. Apparently, I don't know how much of old Kaifeng is left, but this, happened, this has happened enough times to Kaifeng that the waters have come to the walls, that the inside of the city was like 
five feet lower than the outside of the city because every time it floods, it leaves dirt outside the walls. Ah. Oh. And, you know, they close and bar the gates and Interesting. try to okay. keep the water out. Okay. So this isn't the first time this has happened. Okay, so this is an emergency, but not a disaster. As you can imagine, the Yellow River during flooding is huge, and the vast majority of that river is still following its regular course. So a little bit's tipping over the edge, right? right? right. But, you know, most of the river is still, you know, going where it was before. Just right. a little bit's coming off the side. Okay. However, the more water that flows, the more it'll get eroded, the wider the break will get, and which will allow more water through, which will allow more erosion. And eventually, at some point, there's going to be a... So if you don't manage it, it's going to... There'll be a tipping point right. where most of the water is now going to be coming out into the countryside. Right. Right. Because, you know, it's going to be a lower path. The water is going to find a way out there. Right. So you have to stop it before it gets worse. Mm, just because it's not that bad today doesn't mean... No, because again, this yeah. is all dirt. Mm-hmm. It's water. It's an active system. Right. right? It, it, it um, you know, it can all change very quickly. And also, if this happens, the original path of the river... Because the kind of more energetic water is going to leave uh, through the breach. Yes. The original path of the water. It'll be slower. It won't be able to carry the silt. So it'll through. all clog up. Right. So essentially, now the river's path is, through, is going to be through the countryside. Right. And it's, and it's very hard to fix. Right. So there's guys on the scene and river troops. But they're junior and do not have the experience to conduct such a major repair. Okay. They're not sure what to do. There are some attempts assistance by nearby officials, but this is not the only problem spot. Everybody's got problems. The river is like really high, right? <laughs> right. Nobody wants to send their guys to help this area and then theirs breaks and right. then they're in trouble. Yeah. So what should happen is that Wen Chong should figure out how to allocate resources and stop the breach. He's the guy in charge in the area. He should be like, you know, we're, we got to send this stuff there, that stuff there. Yeah, he should do a job. Figure it out. But... And the typical thing you would do in this situation mm-hmm. is you wrap the edges, edges of the breach with stalks. You kind of like plug it up okay. to kind of stop the erosion from getting worse. Because again, if, there's, if it's covered by a protective layer of, you know, of stalks, of like hay bales, mm-hmm. you can't get to the dirt. Yeah. It'll kind of stabilize. Eventually the water will go down and you can kind of figure it out. So you need people, you need stalks. You need, yeah. Yeah. Right. And then, but it, that's what you're supposed to do. That's but what you're you supposed that? to do. Let me guess. No, he doesn't really know what he's supposed to be doing. Even if he did, supplies in the area were low. Wen Chong had attempted to avoid what he viewed as costly stockpiling and spending money on necessary improvements. So much of what had been available had already been used on other emergencies. Mm. Bricks, stones, and stalks were all critically low. Mm. And now, since it's the rainy season and all the roads are muddy, you can't really get more. Right. Right. It's very difficult to get more emergency supplies. It's funny because it's like it's, it's reserved supplies for a reason right it's <laughs> yeah right it's like saying like china like for example china has supposedly china has a strategic por- pork reserve por- yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of a pork, pork is very important to us yeah. Uh, yeah but then you know you you take a look around you're like why do we have all these pork sitting around yeah it's not cost efficient and then so you just use them all and instead of you know putting all into the reserve pile it's like just-in-time manufacturing yeah Sure. Okay, so... So now we have a So the gap widened and deepened. Yeah. Wei Chong didn't really know what to do. Okay. At a certain point, he wraps one edge of it, but like, you know, he doesn't doesn't actually take the emergency steps required. Mm. On August 10th, so eight days after the breach, the full force of the river was drawn through the gap and a thousand meter long, for Americans, that's 11 football fields, (laughs) a a, a thousand meter long breach developed. Only eight days later. Eight days later. Wow, okay. And I think... When it happened, it all started happening very quickly, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. At a certain point, the dirt just uh, starts moving. Also, this is ancient China. Like eight days is not enough to like run a horse from. Well, that's why Liu Yu may just lied on another. All, that's why Liu Yu may just lied on all his reports, right? And, and just kept stock to build up the reserve. <laughs> yeah, kept yeah. stockpiles of everything. Right. So now the whole river is spilling out into the Huabei Plain mm. through a thousand meter breach, and now we're officially in a national emergency. Yeah. Kaifeng is completely surrounded. Before it was wet because a little bit of water was coming through, but now it's like an island. Supposedly the water is up to the treetops. And so even people in boats, you know, they're getting their boats like capsized on trees because they can't see them and drowning and stuff. They managed to close the doors, keep the water out. Um, the main force of the river, though, is pointed directly at the Kaifeng City, mm. at one of the walls, and it almost eats through the walls. But the, re- the residents start just throwing everything in the city down along the edge of the walls, like furniture and clothes and... Hoping to stop it. Hoping to kind of blunt the, the mm. force. And okay. eventually they contain it long enough and the river shifts. Okay. So Kaifeng still has water in it, 
but it's not like washed away. Mm. What now? Right. So what, what do you now? do? So immediately a huge amount of aid goes out. They set up food kitchens, temporary shelter, rice distribution. Well, they did. Okay. Oh, yes. So this huge, huge amount of emergency relief. I'm not saying this is going to be a lot of food, you know, but you know, they, 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 but I'm surprised they had a system to do that. They definitely have a system to do that, but also practical ones because hungry homeless peasants become bandits or rebels. Right. <laughs> okay. So you got to like, keep them fed. So, so we got to keep these people fed. We got to keep them in the area. We can use them to fix the problem mm-hmm. as labor and then they can go back to their fields. Right. Okay. Right? There's some arguments in court that are like, well, do we really need Kaifeng? It's kind of old. It's not that exciting. It's no longer the capital. It was the prefecture capital. Yeah. But it wasn't the national capital, right? And they're like, do we really need Kaifeng? Yeah. Well, it was the national capital at one point. At one point. But, but now it's just no the longer, prefecture yeah. capital. So they can sacrifice it. It's fine. Yeah. And they're like, or province capital. They're like, okay, well, maybe we fix it, but can we wait a few years until we're not at war with the barbarians? <laughs> um, and again, remember, like a lot of these debates are made when by we people. When say barbarians, that's not the official saying, okay? <laughs> that's just... No, it is the saying. They called them barbarians. Really? Yeah. They said that in their Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I mean, that was one of the... That was one of the conditions right, you of can't the opium war. You can't you call can't them, call them barbarians. barbarians. <laughs> So <laughs> okay, okay, fine. So, Until we're stopping, we, we don't no yeah. longer have the war with the the British people, the, British, and the, barbarians, the barbarians. Yeah. Yes, and they're like, can we wait a couple of years? Remember, these are debates had by people in Beijing, yeah, away from the disaster. Right, they're just At thinking course. like, okay, there's some flooding, but this is going to cost so much money. Can we just like, like what's ignore the big this deal? for a couple of years? Yeah, right. But eventually, the decision is made that yes, this actually does need to be fixed. Good. Okay. Up. Interestingly, Wen Chong was actually the one pushing that they just abandon it and just let the river flow out. And seemingly, people at the time thought because he just didn't want to deal with it. <laughs> and if they just, you know, yeah. if they just don't fix it or they wait a couple of years, then it's somebody else's problem. And he just <laughs> did not know what he was doing, right? Yeah. And it That's seems this is what really pissed the emperor off. Right. And he sent investigators and they basically confirmed this Wen Chong guy doesn't know anything. Right. So on a side note, this has a double connection to our most recent water margin, chapter eight. Because not only is we we involving Kai Feng, mm. but Wen Chong's punishment is to stand by the side of the river wearing the conga, the the big wooden oh, collar, no. okay. for for three for three months, and then he is exiled for hard labor in Xinjiang for three months. For three months. Wait, standing next to the river that he messed up? Yeah, for <laughs> three months. And I think he had like a sign that's like I like I'm a bad river man. Yeah, something <laughs> that said like manager. what he what he had done, right? And apparently, so they're like for three months. Look at your mistakes. And apparently, everybody like obviously it's Dao Gong's <laughs> fault for appointing this guy. Right. And Dao Gong was people think he was embarrassed by it, but he you know he can't admit he screwed up, so he just decided to punish this guy instead. <laughs> right. Okay. Wen Chong has a bad day. Bad three months. Bad I think. three months. <laughs> He's exiled. <laughs> okay, so they got to fix it. Yeah. So, so they- you're, you're now under several constraints. Okay. Right. So one, you have a limited time until winter. When the ground becomes too hard for some of the digging required, mm. right? The ground's going to freeze. Right. You just got people with shovels and stuff, uh, especially near the river. It's wet. So you're going to have to do a lot of earth moving. So you have to start quick. Right. right. And remember, the break only happened in August, right? So we're getting near close to the end of the year anyway. Mm. So this moves, this moves faster than you might think. Okay. So the stalks tend to be front loaded. The stalks to make the stalk bundles, which you're going to need a lot of, are front loaded towards the autumn harvest which hadn't happened right. because the river flooded. <laughs> so, yeah. so you're going to have to import these stocks from afar right. around the rest of the country. And that takes time. And that takes time. And then also, though, because this is a biological material, you can't just make more. Yeah. And if you run out, you're going to be in trouble. Right. If, there's, if it's not fixed by next summer, the river will just ruin everything they've done when it gets high again, and they'll have to start over. Right. Okay. So there's a natural deadline to this process. Yeah. Different parts have different deadlines, but generally speaking, they have about four to five months. Okay. Which is not a lot of time to not fix a China, no. thousand meter gap in a river and yeah. force it back on course um, because no construct, no heavy construction equipment, no computer modeling, no concrete. Your only real resources are dirt, people, bricks, stalks, and mm. rocks. Yeah. And bricks, stocks, and rocks are expensive. So only yeah. real cheap stuff you have is dirt and people. And again... <laughs> the human, the people are the, the, the cheapest resource in, uh, in ancient well, China. Well, especially right now because they're, they're not farming. So there's nothing else. Yes. They don't have anything better to be doing. Yeah. And again, you know, there's no... 
you can't go back and ask for guidance. It all kind of has to be decided on scene because, it, you know, you can't wait two weeks to go to the Capitol and ask the emperor and come back. No. So step one, planning. Typically, there would be a long investigatory period with multiple, you know, like assessors and cost breakdowns for every step of the project, including the materials involved. For example, X number of tails of silver. A tail is a, like an ounce, basically, to dig a diversionary canal. X number of rocks on this deflection dike. X amount of cost for security, food, whatever, ropes. However, the officials responsible for this thought there wasn't enough time. Because again, this is like the prefecture capital. It's underwater. We've only got like four or five months. So we can't spend two months planning. Planning. Yeah. Like the planning should have happened a year ago. Yes. Yeah. Well, no one can plan for this, right? This right, is but a I mean, disaster. You know, it should have happened yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So the officials responsible instead adopted a precedent-based approach. So this is what they did. They cited earlier repair projects, and this is from Controlling the Dragon. Citing earlier repair projects as budgetary models, the trio compared the Maiying project of Jingchong, Jingchong 24, which is 1819, Emperor Jingchong, which had been carefully planned and budgeted with the Lan Yi project of 1820, which had been undertaken without extensive planning. Hmm. The former had cost 12 million tails, while the latter had only cost 4.7 million tails. So hmm. the one with less planning had cost less. Okay. They, just, they basically argued that a quick, efficient planning process would be faster and create less chances for corruption. Because sure. The one where you have to plan everything out, there's lots of chances for everybody to get their margin in and right. you know, get little things. So they asked for an initial budget of 4.75 million tails. So there's a bunch of new taxes. There's different ways they had to raise the money. And the interesting thing is, is like when we talk about how much a project costs in the modern world, the money is sort of like abstract. Okay. But like... For this, a project like this in China, it's like the money has to physically be there, right? Like uh, if, if okay. like, yeah. if you have people digging dirt and they get paid at the end of every day and you don't have their money, right? they're not going to dig dirt for you anymore, right? right? You have to, so you have to distribute the physical currency. It, and it physically has to like arrive on there. Right. You have to buy the stuff. At and, this point, and what there's is it? Some, there's some, you know, like when they're getting materials from afar, you know, there's different ways of organizing it. But like by and large... Much much of the money has to get there yeah. and then be distributed right. centrally. Right. Uh, at this point in China, what's the like? Do they have copper coins? Obviously, they have silver. Um, but I don't think they're paying well, the official everyday labor is, silvers. The official currency is copper coins. Okay. And then you have which can go quite heavy. Yeah, and, and lots then, to transport. And then you have silver tails, which are for larger transactions. Okay. Which are I mean, not, I'm sure which are not standardized as coins or anything. Right. Okay. So it's by weight. Yeah. By weight. Yeah. And, and I'm sure if you have, yeah, like you said, like some far away materials or some big transactions you can do, I don't know, the paper money, you yes. know, that was a stamp on it. But still, but, you know, like a lot of the money has to physically exist on site right. yeah. to do this. Yeah. Which is its own challenge. Yeah. Money is also part of the materials that it requires transportation and yes. management. Yeah. What do you do now? You've got some money. So how do you stop this? How do you fix this? Step one, you wrap the edges with stalks to keep it from getting bigger. Now you have to get enough supplies while you wait for flood season to end. Primarily, this is stalks. Quotas were set up with magistrates around the area with punishments for those who could not deliver enough stalks. Oh my God, okay. The materials began to arrive, sometimes by force. Okay. So there's all sorts of issues like when the project gets approved, there's, um, there's like cost um, ceilings for these things. So it's like, we, you know, you're, you're allocated to buy, you know, I don't know, 100,000 stock bundles. Hmm. at this price per bundle and so you would have people who would think oh the government price is too low so they kind of try to like hold out and see if they get a better price or stuff like that and uh -huh. so there was sometimes they would just send people around to just grab the stocks from people to take from the people to take the stocks from the people yeah again and there's nothing else there's not that much else use that these stocks are useful for so well you know but six months later you could double the price i know but i think otherwise they would just burn them and, so it is yeah. kind of a but yeah, I mean, you know, everybody's out to make a buck. Yeah. So step three, you've got the stocks coming. And these aren't necessarily in order. These steps. Well, what was the step one? Money? Wrap the edges of the breach with stocks so it doesn't get bigger. What's the second step? Get the supplies. Get the, get, get the, get, get, get the stocks. Get the stocks. Get okay. the other materials you need, the bricks. Okay, the, okay, gotcha. Okay. The dirt, the, the tools, okay. the ropes. Okay, third step? Dig a drainage canal. Okay, that so makes sense. 
it would basically be impossible to close the breach with the full force of the river going through it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's a lot of water. So you need to divert some of the flow back to its old path. Okay. You do this by digging a canal from before the breach to after the breach. So you kind of like dig a new channel connecting the river from before it has breached to afterwards. Yeah. And so you dig a new path for it. Yeah. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Now, this is sort of a temporary affair. It isn't expected to be the new course of the river, but it will divert enough water to give you a chance. This is a massive undertaking of tens of thousands of laborers and has to be largely finished before winter or the ground will be too hard to dig. Mm. Step four, you have to dredge the old path of the river. When a breach happens, the most energetic water goes out of it and the slow, muddy water that remains in the channel settles down and clogs up the river's old course. So you need to dig all that out and make sure the river will flow properly once you force it back to where it needs to go. So you got to go climb down there and dig all that, dig all that out. Between the diversion canal and the dredging, 120 kilometers of riverbed need to be excavated. Okay. So that's a lot, it's quite right? Long, yeah. Yeah. It's like for the, for us Ameri for my fellow Americans, that's like 90 miles, right? It's so like a two hour drive. Two hour <laughs> drive, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, with freeways <laughs> and it's not like a two two mile line it's like a 90 mile line it's like right it's uh, it's curved <laughs> it's curved and it's also you know it's you know it could be you know 100 meters wide of yeah. dirt you have to dig out it you know meters deep yeah so you know you know so it's very you can see wood cuts of this happening and they're quite quite big mm. so step four and uh, interestingly, what it seems like the payment system for this is, is like, and how they calculate it is they like, they like go down there with buckets and they have to get the dirt and give the bucket. And then like, when you, when you bring the dirt out, they give you like a couple coins, like per bucket. And so they calculate like, okay, this, it's this much dirt. It's this much area. We got to move this much dirt, do some arithmetic. And that's you know, how many buckets. And that yeah. means we have, you know, three coins per bucket. Right. <laughs> and then so this is how much we need to budget towards, you know, digging the canal. Mm. Rebuild the dikes. Typically, two dikes are built, a main one and a secondary one in case the, one of them fails during the process. You don't go back to, to square one. Right. This is a highly technical process as you're expanding an earth wall into the path of a river. You can't just dump dirt in a one kilometer hole and hope for the best because it's just going to wash no? away. So the issue is, though, because of good river management over the past 20 years, there are very few people who know how to perform the repair. Because there haven't been a lot of breaches. We didn't need to do repairs, right? They attempt to call a 70-year-old out of retirement. Oh, my God. But he's too sick. Uh, eventually, though, they get the people by finding people who had repaired, like, smaller breaches on other rivers okay. around China. Right. And they kind of get a, get a team together. Anyone with some experience yes. are summoned. And then, and this is from uh, Controlling the Dragon, the competence of the administrative team at Zhangfu was bolstered unexpectedly when Lin Zishu Arrived at the uh. work site on October 10th. <laughs> Lin Zishu, hero of the Opium War. Okay, you know, yeah, he, I, I do think, so Lin Zishu is sort of a flat character at this point in Chinese history. Yes. Obviously because of the Opium War and it's sort of like, that's who he is. Yeah. But I do think, you know, he has his, he's, he's, he's well, sort of like an establishment it, kind, kind of a politician. So if you haven't but, listened to the Opium War, basically, yeah. Lin Zishu is the guy that the Daogong Emperor Similar to Wen Chong, actually. Puts appointed. In appointed to go down there and shake things up in Canton. Yeah, but he was too competent. Yeah, he was too to competent. Shake, in terms of shaking he, things up. He shook up. things up too much. He burned all the opium. Yeah, did good, too good of a job, which is exactly what was expected and, of him. you know, the foreigners got mad. And yeah. then when they wanted to do a war, Dao Gong didn't really back him up. No. And instead Someone fired, threw him under the bus. Fire him. <laughs> yeah. And I but, feel like, but he is competent, like, well, in terms of... So we're going to talk about him in this, but it's interesting because... Typically, that's one of the only times you see him in a lot of Chinese history yeah. narratives. But he has other careers after, aside from being the opium burner. Yes, and this yeah. also shows that he's not just like a, a guy who comes in and makes like you know rash decisions with the opium. He is a very competent yeah. administrator. Yeah. Outside of that too. Yeah. So. Well, he didn't make rash decisions. It was exactly what they asked him to do. I know. I know. <laughs> As partial atonement. For his, for his failures, he was ordered to stop along the way and help with dike repair. Wait, this was after the Opium War? Yeah, after. Like, after he has been... Exiled. Exiled. So he's on his way out. This is 1841. So he's okay. on his way to exile. And they're like, well, while you're in the area, you can, you can help redeem yourself by um, helping them fix the dike. Maybe they thought he'd drown or something. <laughs> okay. So you know, the, the, the Imperial Chinese court system is just... <laughs> 
Yeah, I know. It's like it's like he's a candle. It's like there's more of you that to to light. Yeah, you know you gotta. <laughs> we haven't used up every scrap of you yet. Exactly. So, okay, but but he gets something to do this. Yeah. So Lin's experience with dike repair was limited, but it was greater than any of the other civilian officials at Jiangfu. <laughs> he had supervised repairs in the Yellow River in Jiangsu in 1825. Okay. Had been financial commissioner of, of Hunan in 1830. And in 1831 to 1832 had briefly headed the Hunan Conservancy. Oh, okay. Perhaps most important, he was, he was a skilled and knowledgeable manager who understood provincial finance. After his arrival, the burden of organization and management fell almost entirely on him. Yeah. So aside from the technical and engineering side, mm. even though he has some experience with that, Lin's issue is basically in charge now of this operation. Yeah. Of making it all happen, getting the materials, getting the money. Well, it sounds like he really has had a long it. career of, of like, you know, trying to make, you know, to, trying to administrate well, you know, things in this Chinese imperial system. He's not just the guy who does opium. You know, he's like, he's one of the best, you know. He's he, not a ju- guy who just does opium. He's a guy who burns. I don't think he did opium, yeah. but yeah, he burned opium. So, and there's a lot for Lin's issue to organize. Mm. You got to make housing on site for all these specialists coming in. You have to create factories on site to make things like rope and to turn the stalks into bundles, make bricks. Okay, Cherry. So you've got the money, you've got the materials, you've got the expertise on site, you've got Lin Zushu. You've got the will. You got the will. So how do we close this 1,000 meter gap in the, in the dikes? How do we stop this 1,000 meter wide water flowing through? I'm sure Lin Zushu has a plan. Well, everybody's got a plan. Okay. So gen- what's the plan? Generally speaking, you, you, you creep the two dikes together piece by piece okay. until they're almost touching. And then just sort of like you're putting your finger over a hose, the water flow <laughs> increases when they get close. Sure. So that's when you finally open up the diversion canal. Okay. The water flows through to the old, towards the old channel you've dredged it all so there's places for it to go you've you've made the original channel deeper okay and then in that time you have while the water is flowing through the diversion canal you seal off the break and theoretically you're all good okay sounds like a plan easier said than done you extend it piece by piece section by section and my understanding of how this works obviously there aren't any pictures of it there's some (laughs) sort of wood cuts and things but you kind of have to visualize it okay you, you, you take earth and stalks together and you uh, pound them down into like a little square, basically. Mm. <laughs> like, like a little... Mud square. Little mud square. And then you drop it down. You push it off the side of the dike into the water. And, uh, and at the start, it floats. Okay. Okay. And you have all these boats in the water with ropes going every which way. And they sort of catch the floating square of dirt... They get it to where it needs to go. They kind of arrange it there with the ropes. You hold it in place. And then you add more dirt and more stalks. Okay. And sometimes rocks and things to it until it gets heavy enough that it touches the bottom of the river. Okay. And then, you know, you can even do other stuff if the flow is particularly strong. Sometimes they'll pound bamboo or lumber all the way down through it into the riverbed like a giant toothpick. Okay. (laughs) Keeping it in place. All right. And then once it's in place, you know, once you've created this new little Lego block of dirt mm. and you've you've packed it down into the bottom of the riverbed, then you fill in behind it with more dirt. Okay. Right. And then, then, you, then you build a wall. And then you build a wall and then you go one step further. Okay. You do this. That sounds like a lot of work. You do this plug by plug. Yeah. Um, step by step, you know, gap by gap. And the whole time you're adding more stock bundles. This whole time you're adding more stock bundles to the outside as you go, mm. right? So it doesn't erode what you've already already built. Already built. Because the water is still flowing while you're water's doing this. Water is still flowing, right? Yeah. So you have to do this. And that's also why you have to pre-sort of compact the dirt and the stalks and stuff before you get it in. Right. Otherwise, it just, it just goes just out, right? It just away, yeah. And also you can't, you know, one, you, you know, and it could be, you know, the water could be, I don't know, you know, 20 meters deep. So you can't build the whole thing and then push it in Mm. it would be too unwieldy so you kind of have to build enough so you can push it in and maneuver it into the right spot yeah and then you pound it down and you keep stacking more dirt on top and yeah eventually you got a new section so beyond the direct repairs 
this, these things where you have to go the thousand meters to close it off, 20 kilometers of new dikes had to be built to properly supplement the original failures. 20 kilometers. So 20 wow. kilometers, okay. right? So when they talk about like, oh, you know, why didn't, you know, that why didn't they just use rocks or why didn't they just use bricks or something? It's like, I don't know if they have 20 kilometers of right? rocks. We're talking, bricks. we're talking modern day amounts of things, <laughs> right. right? So partially due to, to the administrative prowess of Lin's issue and also some warm weather, the ground didn't freeze. <laughs> and they were able to complete much of the digging and dredging by December. Wow. Okay. So this is like three months, right? Right. They've got most of the digging in done. The repair dikes were slower, but they've already cut off, se cut off several hundred meters of the breach. Mm. So they're making good progress. It's December. Remember, the original disaster was August. Mm. So when you think of when there's a pothole in the road and your city hasn't repaired it for six months, mm. think about how far... How fast they How fast they they're were. already doing yeah. this. So winter, though, brings new challenges. Beyond issues like fatigue and frostbite and just general problems with the cold, mm. um, giant chunks of ice would form on the river because, you know, rivers freeze. Mm. And they would shoot towards the gap. Yeah, and they're too heavy and there's too much momentum. And... There's too much momentum. So yeah. they, they hit a boat. They'll slice the boat in half. They'll kill the workers on it. Yeah. If they smash into the... The, the dike, even if you have the stalks and stuff, you can cut through them. You can you can destroy it. Mm, just the op it's the opposite of water. Yeah, Let me think about Titanic, it, I guess. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. hard, right? It, it yeah. bumps into things. So, so now you've got to deploy new things, which this is the thing they knew how to deal with. You have ice-breaking boats called Da Bing Chuan. Oh, okay. How do they break the ice? Which are these boats that go around and they have long poles. Okay. That near the work site, they break up thin ice, so they just like smash it, right? Okay. So, so you know, it's so it does, smaller than sm okay. so it's smaller little pieces, right? Right. Because you know, what ice can't form if the water's you know moving. Mm. And then upstream, when there's big sheets of ice, they redirect them or they capture them. So if there's <laughs> like a giant chunk, yeah, you know, they attach ropes to it, they drag it to the side, you know, or yeah. they. You know, they push it away so it goes down through the middle. It doesn't, you know, hit the people. So at this point, there were people essentially are traffic cops for ice yes. cubes. <laughs> and there'll be issues where like um, there'll be a cold spell, right? That will, It'll be really cold. Mm. And then there'll be some there'll brief, be warm. brief warm weather. Right. And that means the ice sort of breaks up. And now it's really dangerous again because, uh, okay. because you know, it all becomes free flowing. Right. right. And then you have all these big chunks of ice everywhere. Okay. So it's not exactly when it's cold, but like right after it's it was cold. Yeah. And it can yeah. warm up because if it's real cold, then the ice just, just stay in place. Stay, yeah, stays yeah. in place. <laughs> So by it's June, a global warming situation. It is. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is when it's warming and the ice. Um, when temperature fluctuations. Exactly. Yeah. So by January, most of the materials needed to complete the repair were stockpiled. Okay. They had enough to start before, but you know, they're, they want to have enough mm. to complete it. And officials were confident they could finish before the summer storms. By February, the gap was less than 20 meters wide and the decision was made to complete the final push. The diversion canal was opened and the final closure began. However, a violent storm suddenly appeared, sending currents pounding across the repair dike, destroying 100 meters of it and killing several hundred workers along the, alongside the officials who mm. had been trying to save it. Not Lin's issue. He was okay. Okay. They soldiered on, thankfully having enough supplies to repair the damage. Mm. They used increased wages and multiple shifts to repair the damage but two more storms destroyed more of the dike and they began to run out of materials. It's like one step forward, two steps back. Yes. They closed the diversion canal because if they leave that running too long, it gets clogged up as well. Right. And then they can't use it when they need it. They try to figure out what to do. So sensing time was of the essence, the officials on the scene suspended price controls where they just, you know, what they go, you know, we'll buy stocks and, and you know, bricks and things at, at market rate, not our price control mm. government rate. Because so they're able to buy more now. Yes. Ideally. Yes. Yeah. And asked the emperor for 1.1 million more tails of silver to finish the work. And then they just kept going on the assumption that it would be approved, <laughs> which it was. Okay. Well, that's good. So March 8th. So now, you know, so they, they get more materials. They, um, you know, have money and they realize that the diversion canal is still okay. They close it off and they're like, we can use it again. It's not that damaged. Okay. So March 8th, the water flow began to rise suddenly and they're like, okay, crap, what do we do? Do we, do we open the diversion canal 
to try and stop it? Or do we just hope that the repair dike holds and, you know, risk it? And they what do they decide? They decide to reopen the diversion canal. Okay. Even though they weren't ready to close the breach yet. So the diversion canal worked. The repair levees did not, did, you know, did not flood. Good news. Good news. Must be because of Linzoshu's uh, leadership. Yes. So there were several more storms, but the but the repair levees hold held. Okay. And uh, on 19th of March, they did some ceremonies, some additional ceremonies to appease the river gods. Okay. And now it's ready to attempt closing the breach once more. So the final plug is rolled in. Again, it kind of floats at first. So it's mm-hmm. almost like a little, like a door coming down. Right. They keep adding more dirt. They pound it down until finally it reaches the bottom of the gap and the river is sealed. Wow. Overall, the project costs 6.5 million tails of silver. Okay. To put it into perspective, 6 million tails is what Charles Elliott wanted at the start of the opium wars <laughs> for the, the for the yeah. opium that Linz, that Linz issue had burned. Right. So, this is a lot of money. Yeah. Right? Kai Feng was left heavily de- and this is and that's just the direct cost, right? Obviously there was much more of a cost in terms of it does the, put things into perspective when you're talking about the opium war. Yeah. It's like if the I don't remember, do they like th- that amount of ask? Yeah, is money that could be spent on water projects like this, which are very essential. Yes, right. To yeah, to everyone. The money's got to yeah. come from somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. So if you used it to pay the opium, I guess a fine or a repayment or whatever. Well, they're gonna have to it. pay both. Because yeah. <laughs> they're gonna have to pay. <laughs> they're gonna have to pay for the opium too in the yeah. end. So Kai Feng left heavily damaged, right? So the the actual costs are way higher, right? Mm. You have a whole lost harvest. You have all these repairs, you have all these things. And some of that is accounted for in this, but a lot of it isn't, right? Yeah. The peasants lost their harvest, but they're able to return to their land. Multiple officials were blamed, basically everybody who was in charge prior to the disaster. Mm. They were forced to wear the conga for three months along the riverbank, alongside okay. <laughs> Wenchang. Okay, that seems to be the standard punishment for a exile to project sh- Exile to Xinjiang, you know, the standard. Yeah. Um, even those who had been asking for additional funding for repairs. So even people who had been like, you know, Wen Chong, we really got to make this, this this dike higher. They got punished too? They got punished too. They should have uh, asked harder. I know. <laughs> they should have pushed harder. Right, exactly. No, I'm kidding. It's they should have written the emperor. Shame. Yeah. But I mean, that's that's sort of the Chinese imperial system for you. Yeah. Yeah. High risk, high reward. Yeah. Several officials involved in the repair were granted honors or allowed to buy them. So, <laughs> love to buy the honor. Well, if you like donated enough silver to the repair effort, you know you would get like a peacock feather, oh, or a, okay. you know, a coral bead, or you know, you know, is that, you know, what, that, is that actually what the imperial Chinese court? Oh, peacock feather is a big as, one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Wow. No, because you're you're. But what do you do with the peacock feather? No, because you all wear the same hat, right? You're you're. Oh, you're, it's a feather on the hat. Yeah, you're. Okay. You know, you know, I, I, the in the Chinese system, it's like. The, the 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 saying put a feather in your cap makes a lot more sense in the Chinese system because it's a big deal you have a feather in your cap. Is that an English saying? Oh yeah, it's a real like you never heard that saying? No. What it's does like it mean? oh like you you know, you have an accomplishment, you go, Yeah, it's a real feather in his cap. <laughs> okay. Like you know like But literally in the Chinese court system, if you have a feather in your cap, you literally have achieved something. Yeah, because yeah. you I mean it's again, it, it's similar to it's not that different, I guess, from Europe, but it's like, you know, you go to your little fancy things or you go to your stuff and you know you know oh are they are they allowed to wear the fur trimming you know yeah, on yeah, their yeah. thing it's like a like, decoration of you know yeah. are they gonna have that and and it's you know so it's a mark of you know distinction yeah. so it's like cert- a war what do you call it? like if you a medal a war medal yeah yeah so certain people were awarded for the actual repair efforts and certain people were awarded for oh you donated a bunch of money gotcha so okay. we'll give you a peacock feather or a <laughs> order of the sure you can wear it unicorn court. everyone will think that you're different yeah yes lin zishu even though he was praised by everybody on the scene does he still have to go to the <laughs> was border forced, was forced to continue on into <laughs> oh exile. god okay lin zishu does eventually get exonerated yeah a couple of years later they you know they realized you know he'd done his best and they they made him like a governor of some other province and some okay. other stuff but you know he, he still has to go to Xinjiang. he still had to do, do the time yeah yeah he like went to there and he like wrote little articles about like, oh, the Muslims, they do this weird prayer thing. And, you know, here's a story they tell about like a goat. <laughs> you know? So he he's, kept busy. He's doing a little cultural anthropology. Right. Okay. Over there. Over, <laughs> over he there, kept busy. Over there in Xinjiang. Yeah. So that's what I have for today. And I All feel right. like there's a lot more I would I want to talk about, but I think I'll save it for the next episode oh. of 
you know, how is this system where we see, obviously there was a failure. Um, when Chong goes in, he doesn't know anything. They don't do the preventative maintenance. He's a helicopter court official. <laughs> helicopter court <laughs> official. And, you know, maybe it would have happened anyway, right? Maybe it was just the flood was too high. Mm. But then also when the disaster happens, he, you were unprepared. he, he doesn't made... know how to stop it. Yeah. They don't have the materials. They don't have the expertise. Um, and, you know, it turns into a big disaster. But even despite all that, they they get it done essentially relatively on budget mm. and on time. Yeah. Right. And the on time is more important because if, if, if the um, summer floods yeah. have happened again, it would yeah. have destroyed it all. So and then I think ne next episode, I want to talk about then within a decade, it, it, it's all falling apart. <laughs> right. Within a decade. Why is it all falling apart? Well, we'll have to talk about it. Okay. But within a decade, there is you see this, which was this kind of like extremely, I mean, efficient system that has been around for three, four hundred years mm -hmm. of, of managing these disasters, of knowing what to do, of having the engineering, the organization to get things done quickly and perform these big engineering works to just a complete inability to to do this, right? Either um, either financially or mm. skill wise or administratively to just no longer have the ability to keep all this up. Okay. And, and it happens, you know, very quickly. And some of this is just because, obviously, again, every year the river gets siltier. It's, you know, it becomes increasingly difficult, but it does seem to really, you know, ha happen very quickly. Okay. Um, and then... So why, how did they lose that ability well, so we're going to talk about it. We're okay. going to talk about it, and then we'll talk about... We'll talk about... Because I will have to also tune in for the next episode. I know. Like we'll talk about the Yellow River in the age of uh, the Warlord period and the Chinese Civil War. Okay. The okay. Japanese... Yeah. Talk about Mao and the Yellow River. Yeah. And then we'll talk about the Yellow River today. So I think that'll Only be... Only one episode. I think that'll be the last episode. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think look forward to Cherry's uh, Grand Canal episode coming soon. Maybe multiple as well. Multiple. Everything you wanted to know about Chinese rice transport <laughs> and more. <laughs> yes. Well, I do think what's going to be this this episode's uh, t uh, t title is going to be Chinese imperial system, not as inefficient as you think sometimes. I think it's going to be, what's the saying that um, uh, humans will defeat the heavens? <laughs> yes. Rending sheng tian. Yeah. Yeah. Humans will overcome the heavens. the heavens. Yeah. And, you know, they have a pretty good track record. I don't know if they overcame it, but they Suppressed certainly... It. <laughs> they certainly made it livable. Yeah. You know, turned the situation into a livable, um, acceptable yeah. condition. Well, you know, when, uh, you know, Western imperialist forces go to Beijing in 18, in the 1860s to burn the summer palace. Yeah. They're looking, they're marching around Beijing and these areas and they're like, this place is a wasteland. Yeah. They're like, it just floods. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but it didn't just always flood. No, it's 20 there years, 20 management. years earlier. It was all quite organized. Yeah. And then, but they're seeing like the post-apocalypse. Okay. So we're going to talk about the post-apocalypse. We're yeah. going to talk, talk about the apocalypse, I guess. Yeah. And how it got there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not, you know, I mean, they just stopped doing it and then the river just <laughs> did whatever it wants. So it's not, yeah. you know, it's not a big secret, but... <laughs> Well, anyway, well, you know what? Why they stopped yeah, doing it? Yeah, why they stopped doing it? Yeah, because it is a court system. It doesn't just automatically stop. Now, there's this expression, and I'm sure it's a standard like four four character Chinese saying that ev that the the whenever it kept the river kept breaking, where the the emperor's like, can we turn like a uh, like a like a crisis into a opportunity, you know, and just like maybe we just let the river, you know, keep going and doing what it's doing, and rather than fix it. Why is that an opportunity? <laughs> well, opportunity yeah. for what? For disaster? For saving money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think you can take the opportunity not, anytime. It's not you don't really have to wait till the yeah, rivers mess like, up. For like for like not fixing it. What's the Chinese say? I forget. I'll, I'll, we'll talk about it the next okay. episode. Okay, it's, okay. But it's pretty. It's yeah. So anyway, um, thank you for listening, everyone. We appreciate people who like comment, subscribe. Uh, that sounds like a YouTube video. But uh, <laughs> I was gonna say you might have noticed Cherry's been putting Chinese. Chinese titles on all of our episodes and I guess you know this if you're listening this far but it's not because the episodes are in Chinese it's because I think we have a lot of um, listeners from various parts of the world of the world and a lot of them probably speak Chinese as a first language and um, they might want to listen to it but sometimes we make also I'm putting my two cents yeah sometimes <laughs> we make little puns for the titles and stuff and it's yeah. probably a little hard 
to tell what it's about if English isn't your first language. So yeah. Th- there are some episodes that I feel like the English title is just much better than the Chinese one that I can come up with. So, you know, if you do, if you are, if you do speak two languages, just bear with, don't judge me. <laughs> I, I cannot, for example, everyone loves Yuan Shikai. I just, I could not translate verbatim. <laughs> I just, I don't have the. What did you say? I said, uh, for those two episodes, cause, so we had two episodes. One is everyone hates Yuan Shikai. Well, everyone and, loves Yuan Shikai first, and then everyone hates Yuan Shikai. Yeah, so I said that Yuan Shikai is like accomplish, uh, accomplishments and, uh, and like failures. Uh. Chapter of the failures and chapter uh. of the accomplishments. Right. I, can't, I can't bring myself to say that everyone loves Yuan Shikai in Chinese. It's just too, <laughs> I don't know, something's wrong about that. <laughs> Couldn't do it. Everyone did love Yuan Shikai. I could, can't do it. They're like, he's, he's going to be the Chinese George Washington. <laughs> Well, you know what? He Father of he the made nation. a decision that he's not going to be. No. So. <laughs> sure, but the people needed him. They needed him sure. Well, him. you know, we spent two episodes talking about it. I think that's... We uh, spent two episodes so far. So far, I know. <laughs> he does show up all the time. Okay, so... Well, I mean, you. is he going to show up in the next episode? The Grand Canal? You tell me. Oh, okay. All right. Well... I-